Okay, if you'll please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, and if you have a blue Bible with you, that is page 1040. And if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. We're looking at Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Those are God's words for us today. Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to tell you about our guest teacher today. Josh Walker is with us, and we're excited to have him. Josh has a Master's of Divinity. He's an assistant pastor at the Church of the Redeemer in Mesa, and he's an adjunct professor at Grand Canyon University in the College of Theology. So please join me in welcoming Josh. Well, good morning. I would like to um, start off by giving greetings from our church, Church of the Redeemer in Mesa. The um, elders and the saints over there send their greetings to you. Um, and I'd also like to thank the elders, and particularly Pastor Benzinger, for this wonderful opportunity to bring God's word to you this morning. It's a wonderful blessing that um, we do that. I invite you to um, keep your Bibles open if you have them to um, Romans chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 16 and 17. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord and ask for his blessing. Father God, we now in this worship service turn to worship you through your word, Lord. We ask that you would send your spirit upon us, that you would help us to understand what you have here that you have written to us long ago, but that is relevant for us today, Lord. Your word is alive and active and powerful, and we ask that you would use it today to comfort us, to instruct us, to convict us, Lord, to help us leave here transformed, different than when we came in. We ask all of this for the sake of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Our passage this morning is from the book of Romans. I'm not sure I need to tell you this, but for what it's worth, Romans is one of the most important biblical books in all of church history. When the church has felt its doctrine threatened, its ideas coming under attack, it often turns back to the scriptures, and particularly it has turned to Romans to try to understand what is it that the Christian faith believes about these certain doctrines. One noted commentator states the importance of Romans this way. One can almost write the history of Christian theology by surveying the way in which Romans has been interpreted. He's right, of course. Think, for example, of an Augustinian monk who was reading and rereading over the pages of Romans And his reading of Romans sparked what is now known as the Protestant Reformation. And I'm sure you know I'm referring to Martin Luther. It was his reading of this book, of Romans in particular, that came to understand some of the great truths that we're going to look at this morning. So when we turn to God's word, we turn here to Romans with a holy reverence because we know what God has done through it. And we pray this morning he will continue to do through it. This brings us to our passage this morning, Romans 1, 16 and 17. This is found at the end of Paul's introduction to the letter. We know from verse 7 that Paul is writing this letter to believers in Rome, which is the capital city of the Roman Empire. Paul's most likely writing in the year 55 AD, a mere 25 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's important to keep this fact in mind since Romans is about, as we will see this morning, the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about what Jesus came to do for sinners. The very same gospel that Jesus preached is the very same gospel we are going to look at here this morning. 
So this fact that Paul is only 25 years later is relevant to know the close connection that there is between what Jesus taught and what Paul preaches here in this letter. But you may be asking, how do we know that Romans is fundamentally about the gospel? Well, there are two clues, at least two clues to this fact. First, look back with me at verse 1 of Romans chapter 1. There we see this. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Notice here, Paul begins his letter by identifying himself as an apostle. An apostle has a particular task. um, His task was to be set apart for the gospel of God. God. That's what Paul is eager to do here. That's what Paul is letting the Romans know. What I'm about to talk to you about is my commission as an apostle of the gospel of God. The second way that we know Romans is fundamentally about the gospel is found in verses 16 and 17, our text this morning. Our text this morning really forms the thesis statement of the entire letter to the Romans. And it is what I want to focus on with you this morning. In our passage, which I hope to illustrate, it's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul sets forth in concise but clear terms what this letter to the Romans is all about. This is, as it were, his thesis statement. What what, what is the whole point of this letter? If you were to take a theological and exegetical microscope and you were to put these verses under and you were to zoom in on them, you would see the entirety of the book of Romans. So in other words, what we have here is Romans summarized and encapsulated in two short, compact verses that I hope to unpack for you this morning. So what exactly is the thesis statement of Romans? What is the letter to Romans all about? In order to answer that question, we'll look at the outline for this morning's message. The overarching point of Romans is that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's one, the power of God, two, it's for the people of God, and three, it gives the provision from God. Let me say that again for you. The thesis of Romans found in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, is that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the people of God which brings the provision from God. This morning we will look at each of these three points in turn. So first, let's look at the power of God in the gospel. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. But how is the gospel the power of God? Well, first, let's look at the word Paul uses here for power. It's the Greek word dunamis. As a quick aside, if anyone in here is studying Greek or wants to learn Greek, you can remember this word because we get our English word dynamite from it. Dunamis, you may hear that. Dunamis, dynamite, right? Dynamite, when you think of it, it lights and it goes boom, right? It's a very powerful, potent substance. So you can remember the Greek word here, dunamis, means power. And what it means here for the Greek term is it's the ability to perform a particular function or task. So in other words, what Paul is saying here, what Paul is noting is that the gospel is something that God uses to do something particular, And we'll see in a moment what that particular thing is. But I want to stop here for a moment and highlight the fact that the gospel, at least according to Paul here in Romans, is not merely something that is preached and proclaimed. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It is clearly something that is preached or proclaimed. But what Paul says here is that it is much, much more than that. The gospel is far more than something that is preached or proclaimed. The gospel is the means that God uses to bring about a change in the hearts and minds of sinners. All right, so Paul, when he talks about the gospel being the power of God, the gospel is the thing that God uses to bring about a change in people's lives. Let me illustrate that point for you. Think back to Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we have somebody named Saul, who is a Pharisee, who is riding in to the city to persecute Christians. He is going in there with the expressed intent to say, I know there are Christians in there. There are people who are followers of the way, the way of Jesus, and I'm going to persecute them. 
And as he's going into that city, he is met and has a powerful encounter with the living God. And that sinner who was going into that city to murder and persecute Christians is the very same person after hearing the gospel who wrote this letter to us today. See, Apostle Paul. Or another example, think of Acts chapter 8. If you have a moment there, I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. And we will look at a few of the verses there to illustrate the fact that the gospel is very powerful. Acts chapter 8, I'll be reading verses 4 through 8. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Verse 4, chapter 8 of of Acts. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. He said, he preached them the gospel. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Notice here it says that Paul went in, or excuse me, that um, um, Philip went in and proclaimed to them the gospel of Christ. And this gospel proclamation was so powerful, it tells us that unclean spirits left people. It was so powerful that those that were paralyzed began to walk. This gospel that Paul is preaching back here in Acts, excuse me, in um. In Romans chapter 1, is a powerful gospel. The gospel itself is powerful to change the hearts and minds of people. You do not necessarily need clever words or clever designed arguments to bring people to Christ, to bring to them the gospel. All you need to do, at least according to Paul here, is to preach the gospel and unleash the power of God that is in the gospel. It's often been said that we defend the Bible the same way we defend a lion. That is, we let it out of its cage. Right? If I had a lion up in here in a cage and someone came in trying to attack the lion, all I got to do is unlock the door and step back. Right? I don't have to do anything other than let the gospel be powerful. Remember that, saints. Remember that the Bible, remember that the gospel is powerful. So I encourage you, proclaim the good news. Proclaim it boldly and know that the results are not up to you. They're up to God. This is one of the reasons why Paul here is not ashamed of the gospel, because it is powerful to do what God intends it to do. And as we know from the scriptures, the word of God never returns to him void. But what exactly does the gospel, what what exactly does God intend the gospel to do? Well, Paul doesn't leave us wondering about that. He tells us the purpose of the gospel is to provide salvation. Look back at our text. To everyone who believes. The gospel is a powerful instrument that God uses to save his people. This really is the essence of the good news. This is the essence of the Christian message. If you were to ask me today, when you leave, if I want you to know one thing, it's this. It's that the gospel is that God saves his people. That's the good news that we have to proclaim. And Paul Paul goes on to make clear Later, that we are saved in a very real sense from the very wrath of God himself. Look, look at the very next verse after Paul talks about the gospel. He says in verse 18 of chapter 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So by our unrighteousness, by our, by our lawlessness, by, by the fact that we don't live up to God's standards, that we don't do what God commands, we have the wrath of God being revealed against us. That's what Paul says. But there is a way for those who have offended and committed crimes against God's perfect law. God um, tells us here through Paul that we have a way out. The marvelous thing, the thing that makes the gospel good news is 
is that we have committed high treason against the very God who provides a way out. One noted commentator puts it this way. When Paul, um, excuse me, what Paul is saying here in verse 16, then is that the gospel is God's effective power active in the world of men to bring about deliverance from his wrath in the final judgment. It's his effective power. It does what God sets out to do. The power of God is one reason that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. The second reason that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel is because it is for the people of God. Look back with me at the end of verse 16 says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. <clears throat> this phrase clarifies what Paul just said about everyone who believes. All the people that believe in the gospel are made up of either Jews or Greeks or, or, or Gentiles. Here, the word Greek here is being used as synonymous with Gentiles. In the first century, if you were a Jew, all of humanity was broken up into two groups. You were either a Jew or you were a Gentile. If you were not a Jew, you were a Gentile. That was their way of thinking. So when Paul says here that it's for everyone who believes to the Jew and to the Gentile or and to the Greek, he's saying, in other words, it's for everybody. The gospel is for everybody. It doesn't matter what your descent is. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter where your citizenship is. If you are a Jew or a Gentile, which is everybody, then the gospel is for you. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, believing Jews and believing Gentiles. Most of us in the room, I presume, are Gentiles. That means the gospel is for you. Spoiler alert, if you're a Jew in this room today, the gospel is also for you as well. That's Paul's point. There is no ethnic hierarchy in the gospel. Where the gospel goes, there's no room for ethnic hierarchy. Everyone stands at the foot of the cross the same. But you may ask, why does Paul say that the gospel went to the Jew first if both are on the same footing? Well, there's a lot in the commentaries that talk about this firstness, and if you want to go in depth in that, I would um, commend those to you. But I think the simplest and best way to understand this firstness is in terms of time. It's a temporal firstness. Let me explain what I mean by that. The Jewish people were preached the gospel in the Old Testament. They got it first chronologically, right? Think back of a, 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 a very famous passage in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God is talking to Eve, and he says, your seed will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. There in the beginning parts of the Bible, in chapter three, right after the fall into sin, God preaches to his people the gospel. The fact that the seed of the woman, spoiler alert, that's Jesus, is going to come and is going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Also, I think that this firstness could be temporal in Paul's order, right? If you know uh, much about the book of Acts, you'll know that what Paul's pattern was, was when he would go into a new city, where would he go first? He would go to the synagogues, right? And he would preach in the synagogues first to the Jews, and he would reason with them. And then when they rejected him, which sadly was a common response, he would then go and preach to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 17, verses two and three says this, and when Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three, day, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them, that is, he reasoned with the Jews from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead. It says here, Paul went into the synagogues from the Old Testament and showed them clearly that the gospel was there, that Jesus had to die. It was necessary that that happened and that he would rise from the dead. And then later on in that same chapter of Acts, we see Paul, after being rejected, he goes into Athens, 
to preach the gospel to the Greeks that were there. There's no particular reason to understand this firstness here in Romans as some sort of preeminence or predominance that the Jewish people have, but rather that with God, all of us are on the same footing. Paul makes the same point elsewhere. In Galatians chapter three, Paul says this, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So what Paul tells us here in Galatians is that as far as salvation goes, when it comes to the gospel, it doesn't matter if you're male or female. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. Doesn't matter if you're black or white. It doesn't matter. Jesus came to save men from every tribe, tongue of people. In other words, everyone who trusts in the promises made in the gospel, whether Jew or Gentile, you have these promises that Paul talks about here. That is the point. The gospel is for everyone. I hope that that is clear this morning. If you are sitting here today and you think, yes, I know, I know, you said it's for everybody, but, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know my past. You don't know the things that I've committed. You don't know the life that I have lived. And I'd say, you're right, I don't. But I can tell you that a man who was on his way into a city to murder Christians, a man who stood by and watched as Christians were stoned to death, that's the man who's preaching forgiveness in the book of Romans to you. That's the same man that's doing that. There's nobody who is outside of the gospel. There's nobody who is beyond the reach of the gospel. This is another reason why Paul is not ashamed of the gospel that he preached because it's the same consistent message to both the Jews and to the Gentiles. He preached the same message of a way that we could escape the coming wrath, that we could escape the judgment that God has for sinners. But you may be asking yourself, okay, I understand the gospels for me. I understand that, that Jesus, under the, but, but what, what does this gospel um, do? How, how does this gospel exactly save both Jew and Gentile from this wrath that they're, that they're um, under and guilty of? That brings us to our third point which is that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it's the provision of God. Verse 17 is intended to answer this question. How is it that the gospel is good news? How exactly does this gospel relate to us? It says this in verse 17, for in it, that is for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. If you have an NIV Bible in front of you, it'll says for in it, the righteousness from God. God is revealed. And I'll later demonstrate why I think that's a better reading of the Greek text. But for now, we have, for in it, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul's answer to how is it that we are to escape the judgment, how is it that we are going to escape this wrath, is found in the phrase, the righteousness from God, or the righteousness of God. Let me unpack how that works. Let me unpack what Paul means here by the righteousness of God. What he's talking about here is that the righteous status that God gives us as believers. In other words, what Paul is referring to here is that because of the work of Jesus, and I'll explain how this works in a moment, but because of what Jesus did, God can look at us and say, you are are righteous. You have kept the law perfect. That's what we mean by righteous here. You have kept the law perfect, even though we know we have not. Let me explain why this is the case. So first, we need to re-examine the nature of the problem. To understand the solution, you have to know what the problem is. Makes sense? So, When Paul uses many of the words here, um, as he goes on in the rest of chapter one, two, and three, he uses many terms that are legal terms. They're terms that you would find in the courtroom. I'm thinking of terms like impute, he uses, righteousness, justification, guilt, 
just to name a few. So like in today in our um, standard, if somebody were to say that um, they had a verdict rendered against them, when we hear the term verdict, we automatically think of a judge holding a gavel, wearing a black robe, right? Just by using the word verdict, we think about all this courtroom image comes to us. Well, Paul's doing that here with the terms that he is using. In Paul's way of framing the discussion, he's depicting a courtroom. And in this courtroom, God is the judge. And we are the guilty defendant. In the rest of the chapter, from chapter 1, 2, and on into chapter 3, Paul lays out all the evidence that is piled up against us. And he concludes his case in chapter 3 by saying this, None is righteous. No, not one. Because of our sins, because we haven't lived up to God's standards, we are guilty before God. When God were to look at us as the judge, he could rightly say to us, you are guilty. So what does this have to do with our passage this morning? Well, in short, it has everything to do with our passage. You'll, you see, it is this problem of this verdict, this problem that we are guilty and rightly sentenced to God's wrath that Paul is giving the solution to in the gospel here. That is why he is so eager to proclaim the gospel. Because imagine, if the king of the universe is angry at you, and I can tell you there is a way to not have that king angry at you, you want to listen. This is not some abstract problem for Paul. He's not an ivory tower theologian just trying to give some theological discourse. No, this is a real problem for Paul. He has angst because he knows what he used to be like. He knows what he was going to do. He knows what he was about. And he knows that he has persecuted this God through his church. And he's saying, how is this going to be that he is going to be able to look at me and say that I am not guilty? This is a real problem for Paul. And... If you look into your hearts this morning truthfully, you will know that's a problem for you and it's a problem for me as well. The righteousness that God gives in the gospel is the answer to this problem. Let me explain. Think back with me to the courtroom analogy. There is a judge on the bench, God, and he is a good judge. He is a right judge. Good judges who do right things give good verdicts. He cannot simply look at a guilty person and say, not guilty. If he did that, he would be a bad judge. If we saw one of our loved ones murdered and the judge looked at the murderer and said, yeah, not guilty, get out of here, we would be outraged, right? So the good judge of the universe cannot simply look at guilty people and say, we are not guilty, in order for God to give us the verdict of not guilty, we need to be, at least legally speaking, not guilty. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a good judge. This is why the righteousness that God gives us in Christ is so vital. Look back at our text with me this morning. Look back at the end of verse 17. Paul quotes from the Old Testament, from Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul quotes this passage to show that a righteous person lives by faith. But then he goes on all the way into chapter 3 into Romans to talk about how we're not righteous. He belabors the point. He brings up example after example after example of how we are not righteous. But he just says here, the righteous person shall live by faith. So the person in Romans 1.17 who is righteous must not be righteous in and of themselves. This is the key. Instead, they're righteous because of somebody else, because of Jesus. This is what theologians call an alien righteousness, right? It's a weird phrase to use because when we, when we hear alien, we think of something from Mars, right? A little Martian coming down, a little Martian ship. No, that's, that's not what they mean by alien, they mean, by alien, they mean not natural to us. This righteousness is not natural to us. It's not something that we have in and of ourselves. Just as the power of God from verse 16 does not stay with God, but comes and acts powerfully in the world. And just like the wrath of God in verse 18, 
doesn't stay with God, but is poured out on sinners. So too, the righteousness of God in verse 17 doesn't stay with God. Instead, he gives it freely to his people. So think back to me about this courtroom analogy. The judge is about to pronounce that you are guilty. Why? Because you are guilty. But before he renders his verdict, the judge's own son bursts into the courtroom. He has blood on his hands. There's a crown upon his head. Blood flows from it. And he says to the judge, to his father, he says, wait, this person, before you give your verdict, this person is with me. And I have already paid their sentence. Then the judge's son takes off his white robe that he is wearing and he puts it on you. He covers you. That is what the gospel is all about. The son of the judge took your unrighteousness upon himself and gave you his perfect record of law keeping, his righteousness, the white robe, so that when the judge looks at you, he doesn't see what you have done, but he sees what his son has done. That's why he can be the just judge and the one who justifies us, the one who says to us, not guilty. It's because of what Jesus has done, not because of what we have done. This is what Paul means when he writes in 1 Corinthians. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. And it's Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God. Christ Jesus became for us righteousness. And he became sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The reason that we're able to boast in the Lord It's because it's not my righteousness. It's not my law keeping. It's not how good I've been that matters. It's what Jesus has done that matters. That's the point. That is why Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it sets forth this wonderful and gracious gift of God's own righteousness given to people who not only do not deserve it, but we have done things to undeserve it. Let me conclude. Remember back to the beginning, I mentioned how an Augustinian monk, how how Martin Luther read these pages of Romans and it sparked the Reformation. It was these truths that it's the righteousness that God gives us that allows us to be made right that sparked the Reformation. Because you'll see that Luther was trying so hard in his own efforts, in his own way to work towards God. He thought, if I just could do more, then I would be right with God. If I could just pray more, if I could just do more penance, if I could just do whatever, then when I get there, God would be satisfied with me. And he knew no matter how hard he tried, he could not do it. And it's when he came to find the gospel here in Romans that it's not about what we have done, but it's about what Jesus has done for us. He was able to stop working and begin resting in Jesus. Will you this morning with Paul stop working to please God and start resting in what God has already done for you in Christ. All you need to do, it's simple. All you need to do is look to his son, look to Jesus, and receive the gospel. Say, what you did on the cross, I want that to count for me. I want what Jesus did to be for me. If you can do that, you can receive the gospel. This is why Paul is not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God. It's a powerful message. It's for the people of God. It's for everybody. It's for the Jew. It's for the Greek. And it brings the provision from God. In the gospel, we have righteousness. When God looks at us, he sees a perfect, a spotless lamb because he sees his son. This is why Paul can say, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let me say that again and let that sink into your soul. There is therefore now no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me conclude with the words of one of my favorite hymns. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your son, Jesus. We are thankful that by his work, we are able to be counted righteous. We thank you that you are a good God, that you have been merciful to us. You did not have to provide this way out. You could have rightly been a good, just judge and condemned us, but you decided in your grace and in your mercy to not leave us in that state, but to provide your very own son upon a tree to die for us and to live a perfect life for us and to resurrect from the dead for us. Lord, help us to leave here resting in nothing but the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.